Uh, Andre is a man of many talents. Um, he's written a number of award-winning books, um, most recently The Myths of Safe Pesticides. Um, he's a founding member of Regeneration International. Uh, Andre is an ambassador for organic wherever he goes. He has traveled tirelessly over the past, I don't know, five or more years, actually over a much longer period than I'm aware of, but um, throughout the time I've known him, he has traveled to every arable continent, to over 100 countries, uh, and everywhere he goes, he brings the message of organic. He's, he's uh, a able to speak to a wide range of audiences and has written um, voluminously in all sorts of outlets at all sorts of levels. Uh, he uh, is also uh, a practicing farmer and uh, he and his wife Julia run a regenerative organic agroecological tropical fruit orchard in Daintree, Queensland, Australia. And still he's found the time to come to our part of the world. We are very honored. Please give a warm welcome to Andre Loy. Well, firstly, I'd just like to say how delighted I am to be here. As Brian said, I, I'm an organic farmer. I've been farming organically for over 40 years. And when we started, we were largely ignored by the scientific community. We were largely the objects of ridicule. Yeah, that makes up good. So in that 40 years, to see this change, that we are starting to get science. And yes, we're very small. We, we actually did some research into the amount of money that goes into agriculture globally, which is about $60 billion a year. And for every $1,000 that is spent on agricultural research at this stage, less than $5 per thousand is spent on, or get on what we say on projects that can be used by organic agriculture. In this case, we're not even specifically talking about organic projects. The bulk of that is in Europe followed here in the United States. But for me, I think as someone who's been following the science, this is the country where I regard some of the best research has been done. And it's the research that I believe will be very important, not just for the future of organic agriculture, but for the whole future of agriculture. So it's actually got a long-term sustainable future. Like all abstracts when you write them, when you do the PowerPoint presentation, you realize <laughs> you, you have to be a bit more discriminatory. So I just, I won't, I can't go into all the detail in my abstract, but I want to highlight the areas that I believe are probably the most important at the moment. So I've started with Organic 3.0. This is a concept that we, we put out about a bit over a year ago, and it is resonating around the world. And I'd just like to start with what it means. You can see we've got Organic 1.0, our founders and visionaries, Organic 2.0, when we basically put them in the standards, and Organic 3.0, and I'll talk more in detail about it. So if we go to Organic 1.0, these are some of the the major founders, in fact, it's, you know, organic 1.0 is still occurring all around the world. People still have our pioneers and pioneers of new organic systems. For me, I put down Sir Albert Howard because I believe that his book, The Agricultural Testament, was one of the, the books that had the greatest influence influenced people like Lady E. Balfour and the UK Soil Association, which was probably the first official organic association. It very much influenced J.I. Rodale, and Rodale put out the first publication where the word organic gained currency. That was organic farming and gardening in the 1940s. That went all around the English-speaking world, and it's the reason 
we use the word organic and we use it in a specific way based on the agricultural testament which is the recycling of organic matter as the primary management tool. And then I put Rachel Carson there because she brought in the consumers. She started the environmental movement. She, her, her role has been probably the most significant because if we look at our data now, we might have been started by farmers, but now we are driven by consumers. And that drive is, is increasing much faster than the production side. And that's an issue that we need to deal with. I put Rudolf Steiner there. I put him out in his own because he really is out in his own but he has had a major influence. We can debate that, but the fact is he, he was a significant pioneer. So Organic 2.0 really started in the 70s when we started to codify the work done by our pioneers. We started to turn it into norms, and that eventually became our regulatory systems around the world. I firm had a very significant role. We started in 1972 and really we are an organic 2.0 organisation because most of the world's standards and norms are based on the work that we did. The, and it's had a very important role. It's grown the consumer trust. The $72 billion uh, you know, sales and certified has come through so in organic products has come through the confidence that consumers have in certification. It's not perfect and we need, we'll talk a little bit about that, that we have to improve on it, but it has been very important in building trust. As a result, organic is the best known brand in all the, the low house lifestyles of health and sustainability. So organic three points, zero is, is our next paradigm shift. And I'm putting out six features. We, we've had a few think tanks and workshops to come up with ideas, but this is just to start this process. We're not fixed on this, and we want this to be a collective discussion globally. I'm going around the world interesting people. We want your input into this so this becomes our consensus, our collective vision of where we take organic. So we want a culture of inno innovation and to attract greater farmer adoption of organic practices and I've got there to increase yields because I want to talk about this. The, the lack or perception of lower yields is our big killer. Whenever I go around the world and I'm in meetings, we are written off. We're not even thought about because there's, there's this whole, uh, how do you say, this drive where if we don't increase yields, you know, how do we feel, feed, feed this growing planet and we will starve? So therefore organic doesn't even get a look at because it's lower yielding. Now we can argue, and there's lots of ways we can argue that this is a very wrong view but unfortunately, it, to change that paradigm or that thought, it's going to be a lot harder than us actually lifting yields because we do have good science that I talk about where we can lift yields. That's the easier of the two. Uh, continuous improvement towards best practice at localised and regionalised levels. We want to look at diverse ways to ensure transparent integrity to broaden up the organic agriculture beyond third party assurance and certification. Most of our growth now is in the developing world. If we look at the developed countries, and I'll give the examples of most of the EU here in, in the US and in my country, Australia, the amount of acres are increasing under certification, but the amount of certified producers is staying much the same. In some cases can even be decreasing. And that is because they're dropping out of certification. Many of them are still farming organically. And what we're seeing is the farmers with the economies of scale that are taking, taking it up. It wasn't our original intention. I'm, I'm one of the people from Organic 2.0 who put standards together around the world. That was never our intention. But now we're seeing problems. So we need to think this through. If we're going to grow production, 
We can't. We have actually lost in the last 40 years. We have lost more farmers than we have currently certified. How do we get them back, and how do we get new ones? So we need to look at this. It's time to revise it and rethink it to make it farmer friendly. All three of these, you have roles in terms of production, but I'd like to say we, when we talk about science, it's more than just agronomy and agricultural sciences. We need people with uh, PhDs in economy. <laughs> and we need people you know, who do sociology and start thinking about these in a more holistic way. And I think this is the really important thing we want to do. We want to engage with the wider sustainability interests, not just being seen as a niche, be seen as a niche or a fringe. That's a killer for us as well. We have a lot that we can offer agriculture as a whole, and we should be seen as a good partner. Look at complementary approaches. Sorry, just holistic empowerment. And this is a really important thing where farmers are price takers, not price makers. We need to rethink the whole value chain. And this is where we'd like to see cross-cutting science, teams of scientists working together with different disciplines to start working with us, working with farmers, how we can develop these systems instead of at the moment where we really have each of them basically exploiting the other. How can I get it cheaper all the time? And this is where we need to get to the last one, which is true value and fair pricing to internalise costs because we know that the current system is externalising the costs. We, the taxpayer, pay for fixing up the environment, but most importantly, the people who really will pay for this is our future generations. We're stealing from them and that is wrong because they're not here to defend themselves. We need to start taking responsibility for this now and show that, that organic is actually the true cost and true value. These, this is work we need to do and we actually started doing it now with iPhone and we'd like, we'd very much like your involvement as well. So talking about this, one, one of the things that has been very important for us, and we actually started this before Organic 3.0, there was many of us when we got to the world board uh, iPhone board that we wanted to shift organic farming from dogma to evidence-based practices, evidence-based science. This is this is why we see you as partners. And so we started that process and with the help of Feeble, and I'd like to actually acknowledge Brian Baker here because he actually did the work, spent went to Switzerland for a year and got organizations. We've got we've got around a hundred um, members of TIPI, different research organisations and universities on every arable continent. And for us this is really important to get people out of their silos so we can work together, share the knowledge, not reinvent the wheel all the time. Very importantly, you know, the limited funds we've got, if we can spread that across different continents, we can get much better outcomes for our research. TIPI um, the membership is open to all stakeholders, and at the moment it's actually free. And we, so we welcome you to join. Please join. The more, the better. The mission is to engage, involve all stakeholders that um, benefit organic agricultural research, to set a research agenda uh, by set, um, setting a grassroots network approach to foster international collaboration in organic agricultural research. We want to facilitate exchange in scientific knowledge. This is a very important one. Like I said, make sure, there's so much good research out there. There are thousands of papers, yet they're the world's best kept secrets. You know, it's, we need to get that knowledge out instead of reinventing it all the time. And we need to help practitioners disseminate and improve these innovations. I always have a saying, look at these papers, they actually sit, sit there gathering dust. We, we actually need to get that information out on the ground. It's, you know, we need these papers to be more than something that can be cited. You know, and someone can put it as a list of publications. A lot of it is very good research 
and we need that to be applied and I think that is a very important part of it. I've got the website there, um, anyway you, you have a copy of this but please become involved because for, for us this is the future. We need your involvement. So I want to now just move on to some main issues. I've started with this because we actually launched our organic 3.0. Um, we had our official conference in Korea um, last year and we had Fred Kirschman as our keynote. And I've noticed on March 10 you, you, you will have him as your speaker in Anaheim. Fred came up with three words that really resonated with me. Regenerative, resilient and relationship. And the word regenerative has come from the organic movement from Robert Rodale, J.I.'s son in the 1970s when he took over. And I won't um, read it out, you can read it quicker than I can speak it, but I think this is you know, a wonderful way of looking at agriculture, particularly the holistic uh, systems approach and we want to improve our resources rather than destroying them. I think there's that, that, that some key messages. The other one which is starting to come out now is, is this as a paradigm shift away from degenerative industrial agricultural systems to regenerative ones. Once again, I won't read it all out because everybody can read quicker than I can and I can speak it so and you can get copies of it. But so what I'd like to do now is talk about two main issues. Actually, they really go hand in hand. It's climate change because we just had the most important meeting in the world last month in Paris on it and food security and particularly food security in the face of climate change. This is a really important issue. So the first thing I want to do is show where we can fit in based on the research and this, this is very important. People say what has organic agriculture got to do with climate change? The up until Paris, where Paris was a game changer, the talk had been about let's just stop emissions, go over to renewable energy. But it's not enough. And the analogy everybody would give is if I'm on a boat with a hole in it, it's sinking, you have to do two things. One, you have to plug the hole, but secondly, you have to bail out the water. And all we're doing if we go over to renewables is we plug the hole but we also need to bail out the water. In other words, we need to strip that CO2 out of the atmosphere. We reached, or we, actually this year we officially reached an average of 400 parts per million. Um, if you look at the graphs, the you know, carbon cycles up and down and fluctuates depending on the northern hemisphere summer when a lot of the trees take carbon dioxide out. But last year for the first time it peaked above 400 parts per million. This year the average will be 400 parts per million. Um, this will mean a minimum of 3.5 degrees warmer but most likely 5 degrees depending on how you calculate it. The consensus is 4 degrees is catastrophic climate change. Um, the target is uh, really as a Paris what was really good, the target became let's try and do 1.5 or less. We did a lot of work on this because this 350 degrees, which is 2 degrees, is not good. So we need to, t we need to get down to at least uh, 300 parts per million, but preferably a bit lower. So I just want to say here why this is really important. This, in this the World Meteorolo Meteorological organization came out with this just before and this is very useful for us, those of us that were there, to get them to accept lower than two degrees, is that carbon dioxide remains in the atmosphere for hundreds of years. Just if, you know, if there's some miracle and we went over to renewable energy tomorrow and put nothing out, we will still go into climate change. We have to actively take it out. If you went down to three, 350, like 350.org once. Another study came out that showed the, you know, 
about 280 million people are going to be made um, you know, refugees. And it's most of Bangladesh, coastal USA, you know, New York, New Orleans, London. Talk about Bangkok, Manila, Jakarta. These are cities with over 10 million people. But imagine, you know, 2 million refugees out of Syria and the political dislocation that has caused, the wars, the fights, the upheavals, multiply it by 100. And what sort of world are we looking at? Can we cope? And the answer is probably no. So you know, this is also a social crisis that we need, we need to get below. And this is what won the argument in Paris to get down. We should really be going to pre-industrial levels. And that's um, in the 1750s. And that means we've got to take out 122 million, uh, parts per million to reach 275, not 350. Can we do it? So I just want to put up, and this is the game changer in Paris. A lot of us have been talking about this since before Copenhagen and Abbott, and we've had a lot of pushback. For me, it's been very disappointing, mostly from the environmental sector, but from other people saying it can't be done. But this is um, Rat and Lau's figures, and, and Lau to me is one of the great soil scientists. I have a lot of time for his papers. Uh, and so to me, this is good data. There are other figures out there, slightly higher, slightly lower. Um, let's not get caught too much into it. I think the main thing to get across is that you know, the greatest sink is the ocean. We have too much in it now. It's now, um, well, it's not really the word acidity. The ocean is still alkaline, and, but this loss of alkalinity is causing major problems and is to the point where we will, that will actually be worse than what's happening on land and complete collapse of ocean systems if we don't get it out. The, we have 2,700 gigatons. I just want to say a metric, this is metric gigatons, but a metric and US ton, they're almost the same, so you can read them as the same. We don't need to get caught up too precisely with these figures. Biomass, which is wood, is 575. In the atmosphere, we have 848. So we actually have um, more gigatons in the soil than the atmosphere and biomass, forests and wood combined. It is the biggest repository. The, I've got some maths here, but re, at today's levels, the reality is we're going to have to do more than this because it's still going to creep up. It creeps up about two parts per million per year. The, and, and, and this agreement won't even come into force until 2020. And every year we, we are not reducing it, we are increasing. So, but I just wanted to get across uh, as of today that, that, that 122 parts per million is 940 gigatons of CO2. We're using, uh, I didn't want to get into to the mass, but that's 258 or 59 if you want to round it off gigatons of carbon or 260 if we really want to round it off and make it easy that we need to put in the soil. For me, this was the big game changer in Paris when the French government put out um, quatre pour mille, four for 1,000. And what does it mean? Well, if glo on global agricultural lands, if we could increase soil organic matter by four thousandths, four parts per thousand per year, we could basically neutralise climate change. It's not a big amount, and we have data where we're doing it much better. But, and what is, what is really important now that the UNFCCC, which is the main UN body, recognises this initiative as part of what we call the Lima-Paris Accord. This is where initiatives um, are held. And just to explain to people, we don't need to have this in the main document. The main document will acknowledge the Lima Paris Accord and what we call the mechanisms, but you don't have to put everything under the mechanism into the document. It's just that the, the main document signed is, is, is an agreement that the countries have signed off to, which is very exciting. 
with the mechanisms and this is part of the mechanisms. This main document is actually a very good document because it has a lot of mechanisms where we can work to reverse climate change and the word we're using now is reverse. We don't want to stop it because just stop it, we need to bring it back, we need to bail out the water. The many countries have signed on. I, I was at that meeting and we had 25 countries sign on on the first day, a lot of European countries, my country, Japan, Mexico, the, um, the United Nations Food and Agriculture signed on, the International, United Nations International Fund for Agricultural Development signed on, put $200 million on the table. The GEF is the Global Environment Fund, which is the main fund for funding climate change initiatives. They signed on $200 million on the table. The CGIR group, which is the main international uh, research group for agriculture, they signed on, put $225 million on it because they believe it's doable. And many NGOs and you know, a lot, lot, lot of countries put $10 million, $20 million, $40 million. So it's just under a billion dollars was put on the table that day to do this. So I want people to know that this is a serious initiative that where there's some serious money to do it. And, and it is very good news because we now have governments and the, United, the main United Nations agricultural organisations, the main United Nations or international research groups and the main funding bodies now funding soil carbon sequestration. Hit the wrong way. So, where do we fit in? Well, we actually do have some good data now. Uh, we, at Copenhagen, we presented, this is we, iPhone, we went to it, we presented information on um, organic agriculture and, and, and soil organic matter and what we could sequester, but we realised we didn't have any peer-reviewed science. That's an issue. You know, if it's not peer-reviewed, it doesn't exist when we go to... Uh, governments to scientific community, even though we thought it was good data. So we set up the round table on organic agriculture and climate change and started to fund peer review research. So the top one, we did a few meta studies. I, I'm not, like I said, I haven't got time to go through more, but I just want to show you three that have come in much the same. The is a comparison trial that where we looked at um, Mediterranean climates in Europe, here in the USA, which is California, and in, in, in Australia, and su they sequestered an average of 30, uh, 3,559 kilograms of CO2 per hectare per year. Just, I'm using hectares, but um, I know here it's, uh, it's pounds and acres. A pound an acre and a kilogram a hectare is virtually identical, okay, so just think pounds an acre and, and, and you've got the numbers. And if you have a look at um, the Rodale Institutes, they've, they've come in much the same and then we have another one from Egypt that is just slightly lower and it's been doing that for 30 years, per year for 30 years. And this is a really um, thing too where people say you, you quickly reach an equilibrium. I haven't got time to go into that but we know that equilibriums have very little to do with soil type and got everything to do with soil management. If you reach an equilibrium and you can't get more soil carbon then you have to change your management to do it. And that, you know, we have good data now on that. But, you know, with every, when we, every meta review you look at, you know, it's an averaging. For me it's always the outliers that are more interesting. <laughs> And it's the outliers where we need to, instead of dismissing them, take them out of, the, out of the meta review because you might distort your average, you know, you really want to look at these outliers. One, are they true? And secondly, if they are true, why are they getting such good results? You know, and can we replicate it and scale it up? That to me, the outliers are always interesting where, where we should be looking at, at our research, not just trying to always fit into the average. Here's one, and I, we've got bigger outliers than this as well. Um, but this is the Rodale, this is a very good one again, and the, um, it, it did eight uh, kilograms, 8,000 kilograms 
in other words, 8,000 pounds CO2 per acre per year. When we sequestered, so when we extrapolated against the FAO figures for agricultural land, just say if we wanted to scale this up, we, we could remove um, uh, 40 gigatons a year. In other words, in 24 years, we could reverse climate change with this system. Considering the hundreds of years it's taken us to get here, this is, this is pretty effective. The other one where we're starting to get good research on is grazing. And it's been a really hard one for me. Anecdotally, we've had lots of, of papers, but the peer-reviewed literature is very, very light. It's only, it's only a handful. And, but that, that now, fortunately, is changing. And we're starting to get them. So I, I just want to just pick one, because I haven't got time to go through them all. But I think this is a good one. This is in, in Arizona, in a very arid area. These are the areas where people tell us you can't do it. But what we're getting out of the literature now is that grazing systems done properly can be the best at putting carbon into the soil and increasing it. In, in this case, uh, we, we looked at what if, if we just um, extrapolated it against the, the United Nations food and agriculture data for um, grazing lands, which is 68% of recognised uh, agricultural lands. And then Hello, we seem to have lost the audio. Ho um, hopefully we can get that back on. Um, Thank you for your patience. Um, we are just working on getting the audio back. We were listening to Andre Liu of IFWAM speaking. About Looks like he's going to one to nine to one, even down to seven to one, um, carbon to nitrogen ratio. If we increase our soil organic matter, we increase our nitrogen. It's, it's been the other way around. People say if we increase our nitrogen, we increase our soil organic matter. That doesn't work. We burn the soil organic matter down. We do it the other way around, we actually increase the nitrogen. And so what I've done here is just a rule of thumb again, a 10 to 1, just to make it really interesting. But I just want to show you how much nitrogen, if we've got the 3% um, soil organic carbon, which is 5.1% soil organic matter, we've got 7,200 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare, seven tons per hectare, 7,200 pounds. If we've got that, why do we need to put a few, you know, 100 pounds? We've already got over 7,000 pounds. Why do we need to put a few hundred pounds of, of, of nitrogen into the soil? And I would say it's something, we're doing something very wrong. We can't get that nitrogen cycle to plant available. And now we have lots of peer review papers showing that Plants use organic nitrogen. This idea that only use nitrate or ammonium is not right, particularly when we start looking at natural systems, forest systems, the bulk of nitrogen that is taken up is an organic form. What we're seeing now is that, uh, particularly in amino acids, but amino acid precursors like peptides, peptides especially, they will take up. You need to get this biologically active so that those amino acids are being broken down and, 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 and available for plants. So it's a matter of soil management, how to get this to be used. Okay. The last thing I just want to talk about, I've run out of time now, but is food security. We know now that one in 30 year events are now one in five and increasing in terms of, of adverse events, droughts, for instance, we're just getting over one now. And we are, you know, as a result, we've got Godzilla, El Nino, and to Africa and parts of my country are either in flood or drought. The, so supplying food in the face of this, you know, what I call climate disruption is critical. We do have good studies showing organic yields are higher in climate extremes. Just some of them. What I want to show, and I think this is a really important one now, uh, this is from feeble dock trials, long-term one where where with the organic one, we've incrementally increased the soil organic matter every year. Conventional, good practice conventional. This is peer reviewed, published in Nature. And you see when it rains, the organic soil has kept its integrity. You'll go on to make a good crop. The conventional will have to be replanted if they're going to have a crop. And so I want to explain here 
One of the most important components in soil organic matter, particularly humus, works like a glue, holds the soil together. So this is the Rodale Institute, um, and showing where you put the organic soil with the organic matter, it actually absorbs the water, infiltrates better. It keeps its integrity where the conventional collapses and erodes. You go further down and look at humus under a microscope, we can see it's a sponge, it's a polymer, it's a sticky polymer, but it holds up to 30 times its own weight in water. It holds most of the nutrients as well. And we know also from long-term work that in forests, the average age of humus is about 2,000 years from carbon dating. So what does that mean? This is work done by one of our MA students. In this case, I put it into gallons. Um, but, you know, per hectare, 12 inches. If we have 1% organic matter, we can have about 16,000 gallons, about 3, 4, 5%. I put 6% because that's what I did on my farm. You can hold, you know, just close to 100,000 gallons per acre from your rainfall. If you're 1% and it rains, that's all you can hold, the rest runs off. If you can build it up, you absorb it, you take it, you keep it in the soil. And this is the Rodale Institute in Pennsylvania in, in the drought. And you can see the difference between the conventional and the organic. And that is due to the water holding ability of organic matter. Both, you know, both of these are by good practices, good conventional, good organic practice. It's very important. This is uh, David Pimentel of Cornell University. Um, he was the lead author of the study. And what they found was an average of 30% more yield for organic in the drought years. So as we continue to go into climate change, this is really important information for resilience. So, yeah. The last thing I just want to do, I'm just being told to round it off, so just quickly, I just want to show, and most of you will know this, that you actually have good data. Now that we're starting to get um, science, we're starting to see uh, where we are getting higher yields or equal yields. The Rodale is getting equal to higher yields. The, this is Wisconsin, the uh, Iowa State, Cassin Delay, the Washington State, John Ragnall, you know, you know this, I don't have to go into it. For me, I, I, I'll just run through this quickly before you kick it off, right? You know, I, what I really like is looking at innovation, continuous improvement, the, the Rodale no-till systems. This is where we, this is one of the areas where we need to start doing more work, taking this research that Jeff Moyer and Rodale have done and you know, working out how to scale it up, how to make it work in all different climate zones. But, to, but the preliminary results of Rodale, I think, are quite impressive. The yields are higher than, than the county average. And when we look at the um, energy use, we talk about climate change, the significant difference that we're using our tractors less and also pulling less heavy gear to do it. So you know, this, this to me is really critical work that we need to work on. The last thing, and then you can tip it off, okay? <laughs> I just want to show also where we have very good data where we work in the developing world where most hungry people are. They produce 80% of the work of the food in the developing world, actually 70% of the world's food. And that most of them live in the developing world, but we know when we, we introduce good organic practices to these traditional farms, we can get yields of around 100%. Catherine uh, Badgley and all set up 2.7 times. The, the, I just want to end on this, which is Ethiopia. It's back in drought again, but this is, remember, live aid when, when millions of people died, or thousands of people died. And this is what it was like. One of our members worked and with the people in Tigray, and they work on the whole of the systems. They rehabilitated the hillsides, the gullies, planted legumes and long grasses. Uh, then they used that biomass for compost, and this is the result. And it's a very good study. It's actually 900 samples over seven years, and everywhere you look at the green bar, 
Now you have double the uh, lowest bar, which is the traditional system. It's actually higher than the chemical one. And so this is the last slide for answering this one. I suppose what I want to say, what I'm very excited about, I don't know if people read last year, which was only a month ago, and then that drought is back in Ethiopia because of the Godzilla El Nino. Ten million people are suffering. Now, I've talked with the lead author of the tea growth process um, in, in Copenhagen, and I said, how are the tea growth farmers going? And they're going very well. And then she sent me, last week, before I came here, these preliminary results of, 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 of scaling up push-pull technology. The push-pull started in corn that's used in other grains, but I want to show you, these are pictures I took two years ago there, where this is being used in mangoes and chilies, you can use it in anything. And this is what I call a game changer. The rest of Ethiopia is in drought. Ten million people have lost the work off their land. The results of the push-pull trials that I saw last week was they're increasing yields in the face of a drought with these organic techniques. So I want to end on this because I actually think we're in probably one of the most exciting times with innovation and where we can go with new systems to increase food yields. And, you know, if I was a scientist starting out now, I'd think I'd have a wonderful experience. And I wish you guys the best. Thank you.